mainly uh, because of the de uh, devaluation of the dollar, because of the protests, protesting from uh, uh, places like Mashhad to Shiraz to other small cities, or selected places in Tehran, if you're from Tehran, Valley As uh, Square, uh, or elsewhere, and then we hear about a lot of people are being replaced within the government, current administration in Tehran. Then we see a lot of Twitter fights uh, between uh, President Trump and then uh, Mohammad Javad Zarif, and then we see Ahmadinejad just jumping in and saying, give me the list of all the Iranians that got the green card. So it's a lot of noise. So if, uh, if you are thinking about uh, unsubscribing your Netflix and watching a political drama, just watch Iran. U.S. show for the for the foreseeable future, and I think I think uh, you're going to be entertained for a while. So uh, um, when I was coming to Florida, and I thought about it, I was on a flight to Florida I, I, to Miami. I thought about what am I going to talk about? You, there's so much about Iran. We all have opinions about Iran. So um, what can I talk about to bring a different perspective? Not right, not hopefully not wrong, uh, uh, but also. Give you a sense of where we are and last night i was in uh this district probably you can identify where this is uh winwood that's right uh and to me it was interesting because i i'm a firm believer if you want to learn about a location uh also see what's on the walls talk to people and uh, it gives you a gives you a good perspective and uh thanks to mr goldman that turning uh that neighborhood into a fantastic um, in a way, um, hipster-ish, kind of New York, Williamsburg-ish type, or maybe Williamsburg, New York should say Win, uh, Winwood-ish. Um, but um, so I, I, I thought about maybe we can start with this. And I, I kind of thought about what's really happening in the streets of Tehran, what's happening on those walls. And I saw some really cool pictures um, that for those of you that travel to Iran, you've probably seen it. And those of you that uh, haven't traveled to Iran, it is a very interesting paradox between daily life, politics, economics, and a lot of loaded questions, but also the pictures that we see, if you will, kind of the graffitis, the pictures, the graphics, kind of, a, uh, um, if you will, the Williamsburg Winwood of Tehran. And uh, I, this is one of my favorite ones. It says, happiness is uh, free. And um, so I, I figured maybe we should start from from some of these pictures, and uh, really, one of the things that one of the one of the pictures I really like was this one. Um, uh, uh, people asked me, I said, they said, "Do you have a political opinion?" I said, "You bet I do." They said, "Are you political?" I said, "Absolutely not. My business is politics. Uh, I look at politics without emotions, whether it be at Iran, the United States, elsewhere. So I try to." Uh, de-emotionalize politics and look at it. So I'm a big fan of diplomacy. I'm a big fan of talking. I'm a big fan of, in a way, trying to figure it out together. And I, and I kind of like that. I mean, the, the name of the street, Ruth Khan, a passage of time, and then there is, there is this, I mean, it was, it was fascinating for me. This is what we need. And, and if I could tweet it out to Mr. Trump and Mr. Rouhani and else, I would be tweeting something like this. But that's besides the point. Um, we're gonna be talking about two things tonight. First, we're gonna talk about, if you will, uh, the political geography of Iran. Enough said about the political geography of Iran, but we're gonna, we, we, we try to address it a little bit. And then we're gonna talk about the functional geography, which I am interested in, more so than the political geography of, of Iran. Um, most of you have seen this and have been to this brick wall. Anyone recognizes this brick wall? Sephardat Iran, U.S. Embassy. Yeah, <clears throat> U.S. Embassy. When my parents came to 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 America, they always made it very easy. They said, "Listen, back then, I would even send my passport, and the end of the day, they would bring it back. They would stamp it. I would come to America, study, and uh, then they give me the and I, I I check that story with all Iranians. Most of the Iranians I know, it's roughly about the same story, right? Um, but this still remains on this brick wall in Tehran. And uh, this, in a way, the seal of the United States, in a way, kind of, uh, if you will, a rusty seal, a kind of a depleted seal, is, uh, is really marking this, if you will, uh, a generation or many generations after this 1979 revolution that have only known co conflicts and friction. And uh, for me, 
the seal really represents what, the, uh, what this relationship between the two countries is, and frankly, has been since 1979, but also hasn't really much changed after, if you will, JCPOA. Now, obviously, this is an Iranian embassy in uh, Washington. It is vacant. It has been used about nine or uh, ten times since 1979 for various events, but it is kind of vacant, and I tell you what, the cameras don't work because I actually drove around it, and I didn't see the Secret Service coming again saying, what are you doing here? So, uh, um, still there, um, and it's in a good area. And for a lot of Americans, when we talk about Iran, the Americans that do remember uh, the 70s, or perhaps they were going to college back then, or they were getting ready to go to college back then, they remember these pictures. And for a lot of Iranians that were in the United States during that time, they remember this picture, or these types of, if you will, uh, environments. Let's fast forward. Um, September 11th, 2001, was the first true optimistic sign between the United States and Iran. What, what happened? This is Tehran. It's a candlelight vigil in Tehran, right after 9-11. Iranian President Khatami sent a message of condolences to the United States. And uh, uh, we thought there was going to be, if you will, a glimpse of hope between the two countries. The Iranians wrote a telegram to, uh, um, uh, to, the, to the White House, at the time to the office of the Vice President Cheney, and they said, hey, listen, we're going to be willing to work with you on various matters, be it Afghanistan, be it fighting terrorism. And the United States, for the first time, or one of the few times after, uh, if you will, 1979, found common denominators with the Iranians on the issue of Sunni extremism, whether it be a Taliban or Al-Qaeda or uh, Al-Shabaab uh, or branches of Al-Shabaab, if you will, in, in Africa. So. The, the letter was drafted by a gentleman named Kamal Kharazi. Kamal Kharazi is a relative of uh, Iranian supreme leader. And uh, many late, uh, years uh, later, they asked Sadat Kharazi, his nephew, say, uh, so what is up with this letter? He said, is, is, uh, they asked him, did the supreme leader know about this letter? And his reply was, do you really think we don't check every single line before sending it out to the White House? So in a way, it assured us that the Supreme Leader was in favor of sending le that letter to the, to, the, to the White House. That letter was very much so, if you will, rejected. This is prior to the first bomb that was dropped on uh, very close, I think, if, if I remember uh, uh, um, uh, correctly, was March 20th, if you will, 2003, uh, when the first bomb, again, on the, probably a few hours before Iranian New Year, that bomb was dropped in Baghdad. And uh, what, what happened was uh, the Americans said, well, wait a second, we're not going to be talking to the Iranian. And the reason they wrote us this letter is because they were afraid they were going to be next. So the hawkish, if you will, Washington kind of uh, uh, took a step back and uh, decided not to negotiate, if you, will, with the, um, if you will, with the Iranians at that time. Okay. There are many charts I can use to explain U.S.-Iran relations uh, for a long time, but this relation has always had friction from, uh, from the coup d'etat in the 50s all the way up to when Shah departed Iran to the Islamic Revolution to the Iran-Iraq War. This relationship wasn't a very straightforward relationship, so I'm not going to go through, through this uh, uh, for you. But what I'm going to focus on is I'm going to focus on what happened at, in around 2000. In 2009, the United States, for the first time, and this is the key, decided to use, if you will, economic options, which is a potent national security, if you will, tool against Iran. Anybody knows when the United States used that option previously in such extensive manner? Any guesses? 1941 in, against the Japanese. Prior to the Second World War, the United States used all embargo, all the, the treasuries, folks at the treasury, some of my friends, they call it, the, they call it uh, using a nuclear option on, on Iran. 
So they used that extensive, if you will, option on, on the Japanese in 1941, and later on the Japanese did what? They attacked Pearl Harbor, and then the uh, United States entered the uh, Second World War, right? But so the treasuries and the, the, if you will, the Obama administration, when they walked in, they said, listen, we're gonna be using this option. And the biggest challenge was to make sure you get the broader international community to help, uh, if you will, the United States to de-swift Iran in a way and to uh, make sure that Iran comes to the negotiating table. This is one of my favorite photos of President Obama. And this is President Obama sitting in Camp David. And they asked him, I said, they said, uh, Ben Rhodes asked the president, he says, Mr. President, um, you are, I haven't seen you so passionate about a particular foreign policy issue as much as I'm seeing it with your passion and your devotion to the Iran deal. And the president gave him a very interesting uh, um, answer. He says, I'm not interested in the Iran deal. I'm interested in taking the military option off the table. So from that moment on, even Obama administration's objective for signing the deal with Iran was not to, if you will, have a breakthrough with the Iranians. The real, the true, if you will, objective was for the uh, military option to be taken off the table. The president was not interested in getting involved in another long war in the Middle East. We had Afghanistan, we had Iraq, in Yemen things were getting kind of ugly. Uh, we had Libya crisis with the president, uh, well, well, Libya cri crisis came after, but we knew um, uh, uh, Gaddafi is not gonna be the person that the United States is gonna be really working with, if you will, long term. So the president wanted to take, take the military uh, option off the table. So what the president did is the president started the negotiations with the Iranians through the Omanis early on uh, and towards the end of Ahmadinejad government and in the beginning of, if you will, uh, Mr. Rouhani's uh, first term. And then we had, the, if you will, uh, Mohammad Javad Zarif, a very, very charming man with what they call it, with the, they call it, uh, he has a, a charming smile and, uh, or I'm sorry, disarming, if you will, sm uh, smile and charming personality. That was Mohammad Javad Zarif. My first interaction with Mr. Zarif, Dr. Zarif, was at, the, uh, was at his office in New York. At the time, he was, if you will, um, uh, Iranian ambassador to the uh, United Nations before uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad called him back and said, listen, I don't want you to be there, come back. So he came back and he took an academic post. Mr. Zarif is no, uh, uh, in my opinion, is the most complex Iranian I've ever seen. He understood, if, if, if there was, I would argue, if there was an election in the United States and Zarif would run for political office, he would win. He was charming. He was charming the American way. He wasn't just charming the Iranian way. So he was the right person. And the Obama administration, when he became, if you will, the foreign minister of Iran, thought this is kind of, Iran's way of signaling to Washington that, hey guys, we're ready to talk. And that's what the negotiations, how the negotiations, if you will, started. Um, I was in Tehran at that time, and I remember, um, uh, I, I remember this well, that we were talking about, uh, there is, this is going to be a long road. Folks like Bibi Netanyahu and others got in there, went to Congress, with, if you remember, with John Boehner, and they decided to kind of, in a way, backstab the president politically and say the Iran deal is not a good deal, and they, th uh, they tried to do it through the legislative side. And it didn't work. If I have to look at Javad Zarif's past decade of political history, Nothing, and I mean nothing, gave him the hardest emotional, psychological, even physical challenge than a 15 minutes walk he took with the American Secretary of State in Lausanne, Switzerland. That 15 minutes walk cost the Zarif greatly. Not just, if you remember, John Kerry was being, uh, if you will, uh, placed between rock and a hard place by a lot of think tanks such as American Enterprise Institute, Foundations for Defense of Democracy, but Zarif also took a hit big time, if you will, by the 
uh, by the Iranian Majlis, which we're going to uh, talk about it a little bit. I want to talk about JCPOA a little bit. JCPOA by far was the most narrow deal that was signed between the United States and Iran and the other parties, we call them the P5, right? And the reason it was narrow, because the US and Iran could not agree on much. And JCPOA's objective was to buy time till Iran will have a political transition if you will, in the next 15 years, 10 to 15 years, and the United States was hoping that we can keep this fragile deal in place, and if we do keep it in place, uh, Iranian leadership's behavior is gonna change. Even they were arguing the mid-rank officers of Red Revolutionary Guard Corps are less hawkish than the ones that we're seeing today, because today's Revolutionary Guard seems to make a transition uh, of what the Chinese did back in the 70s with PLA, People Liberation Army, very ideological, but now they become more uh, uh, economically oriented. And they were betting, that's, a Was that's Washington, that the, uh, the Revolutionary Guard being very hawkish today is not gonna be the case in 10 years or 15 years because their mid-ranking officers are going to be perhaps much less, less hawkish. I was in Tehran the day the deal was signed. This is somewhere in Bani Asra, I think, because I can tell from the tree or Pahlavi Street. Um, and, uh, uh, for me, it was an interesting moment because um, average Iranians, when they went to the street, when they, 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 they were cheering, they weren't cheering because of JCPOA, because of JCPOA. they were cheering because they, they thought they were, they, were, they, they were wronged by the Westerners for a long time. Now, they're beginning to kind of take the right place. They're beginning to be heard. And I'm talking about average Iranians, right? So that was, if, if you will, the mood in Iran. And this is, this is my office in Tehran. That morning, my phone was ringing off the hook. I, I was getting calls from, you name it, from American companies, I cannot say, uh, disclose their names, from European companies, from executives, from you name it, they were calling me, who's where, what do you think, what's the next deals? So all the investment, all the top investment banking firms in New York, they were calling, what's the next move <coughs> transactions? They were trying to explore the Iranian market. One of those calls was from a company uh, called McKinsey. Um, McKinsey, um, managing partner in, in Paris, who was in charge of the Iran desk for McKinsey, um, called and says, listen, we're writing this piece and we're very much optimistic about Iran. I was, well, well, that's fascinating. So how optimistic are you? Put a dollar figure behind it. Anybody wants to take a guess, dollar figure? Billions. Billions, okay. There's a, between one to 1,000 oh, billion, so, but any other guesses? Multi -billions. Multi billions. any other guesses? Any higher bidders? I feel like I'm in Sotheby's right now. Any higher bidders? <laughs> My, um, multi mega billions. How about this, how about this number? Three. One Three. trillion dollar. Wow. McKenzie looked at Iran as a one trillion dollar opportunity. If you were following the stock market these past few days, Apple just reached that number. Yeah. If I add up the zeros, I think I'm looking at 12 zeros. Yes, sir. Am I? Oh, I'm not that bad in math, although I was. But uh, So we're looking at 12 zeros, a trillion dollar opportunity. That's a, that's a huge number. So when I talked to McKenzie uh, folks, I said, hey, listen, are you sure about this? They said, we're not, but the Americans are telling us that's how big it is. I said, the Americans are telling us. Well, that's, that's fascinating. So, McKenzie wrote a fantastic piece about Iran, you know, calling it a $1 trillion opportunity, contributing to $3.5 trillion of growth globally as Iran is gonna reconnect to the world and blah, blah. I'll be more than happy to, to by the way, to share this report with you. And then they talked about Iran's diversified economy. Iran is uh, like no other economy in the region. It's becoming more diversified, less dependent on oil, more uh, diversified within the sectors. And uh, it, is, it has a vibrant, huge, gigantic middle class, very educated. Women are thriving economically. They are thriving politically. They are thriving, if you will, educationally. Iran is it. It is just growing. 
I called my parents. I said, Mom, Dad, I will never come back to America. I'm staying here. I think this is, this is where I'm going to be ma making my next 10 to 20 million, right? So then, then we look at the investments. We look at the, if you will, the growth where it's going to happen. It's going to happen in oil and gas. It's going to happen if in, in the auto sector. It's going to happen in high tech. And it is just simply the best place to be in. And I'm not saying it patriotically. I'm not saying it with emotions. I'm just saying it with the numbers. Iran was also doing fantastic in the startup scene. For whatever we had here in the United States, from YouTube to Amazon to Craigslist to Groupon, we had the Iranian version of it. And it wasn't just a name. I mean, Tahfifan, which is a Groupon of, uh, of Iran, was working. I bought a, I bought a refrigerator from it was working. YouTube, which is Aparat, is still working. I sometimes have to download a lot of Iranian uh, mini TV series for my mom by Aparat. Or Amazon in Iran, which is Digicala. Everybody's using Digicala in Iran. So everything seemed to be working. Everything is wonderful. Nothing can go wrong except one thing. Iran's environment is depleting at the most rapid rate globally. Iran is going through a drought that it hasn't seen before. Iran's drought is becoming a political drought. From Khuzestan to Sistan and Baluchistan, we're seeing tremendous amount of drought. From Lake Urumia, which is the most symbolic case that we have, we're seeing tremendous amount of tremendous amount of, if you will, water-related problems. Yet we see so many foreign companies are coming from you name it, everywhere, everywhere but the United States, and they're signing deals. This is in one of the high-end shopping centers in Iran. It kind of is, it's kind of like your brickle uh, city center, or uh, it's like your uh, design district. But uh, I was shocked for the first time I saw the American flag over there. I took this picture, uh, and I was like, "Whoa, wait a second! We got the U.S. flag. This is this is this is insane. This is faster than what I thought." Every member of Iran's diplomatic team was also giving a copy of the JCPOA signed with all the, uh, if you will, all the diplomats and senior diplomats from uh, deputy foreign ministers to foreign ministers of uh, P5 plus one. This, they were giving it out as souvenirs. Things were doing great. Then Iran moved forward, how we're going to revive the economy. Now we got the deal out of the way. Uh, and Mohammad Javad Zarif and others were really thinking about how we're going to put economic diplomacy in place until Hardliners in Iran got up and said, well, wait a second. Mr. Zayi, what were you doing walking 15 minutes? Intimacy with the enemy. What was that all about? And Zaif had the toughest time in the Iranian majlis after JCPOA. He felt that he was betrayed. He felt heartbroken. And he kept his quiet. But we saw these things. But to us, this was noise. It wasn't of much importance, if you will. Then we saw another thing. Anyone realizes it recognizes these pictures? This is Russian airplanes. Russian planes. Till Mr. Putin. I know we, there's a lot of talk about Mr. Putin nowadays in the context of collusion uh, and U.S. elections, but then Mr. Putin shifted from his, if you will. Uh, a strategic Russian mindset, which I never believe he ever had one, to becoming a political opportunist. Russia decided to use Iran. This is a huge deal. Iran's military bases to start an attack, air campaign on Syrian soil. That was a huge red line for Iranian public, Iranian majlis, and the U.S. national security establishment. And that was the moment that we saw, if you will, the Russians all of a sudden. By the way, something about Russia. Iran has, in the past 200 years, Iran lost more territory to Russia than it has to any other country in the past 200 years. So this was a shift, this was a change, this was what this was, we don't know. But it had a tremendous negative consequences, both within Iran and outside of Iran. 
I wrote a couple pieces um, back then about Russia. I said, uh, I still argue this piece, uh, and I say, Russia is a very good a, a tactical ally for Iran, but never a good strategic ally for Iran. You want Russia, economic connectivity. You want politics, don't go after. And I still make this argument. So I got this, I got the, I got this published in the Tehran Times, and we were debating it. And I got, a, I got, I got calls from a, a foreign ministry. I was in Tehran at the time. They said, they said, Ali Abadi, what do you think? Why did you write this? I said, Well, I genuinely believe it. And uh, and uh, the con the conversation took a different turn. So I, I stayed off of uh, uh, Russian, if you will, conversation. During the same time, something else happened. A young Mohammed bin Salman, or known as MBS, was rising to power in Saudi Arabia. You know, Ben Salman is my age, and he's in his mid-30s, young guy, um, still very much affected by Iran. He blames, if you will, Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia on Iran. His argument is, we were a moderate country like you, but our leaders back then were scared because of your revolution, so they decided you were, you were exporting your Shia revolution, we wanted to export our Wahhabism. And that's the results, we're seeing it in Pakistan, the results, we're seeing it in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And that was the mentality of Mohammed bin Salman. And bin Salman also was extremely upset, and frankly the broader royal family was extremely upset because they, uh, what they heard from President Obama was a bad message because President Obama, in his last on the record interview with Atlantic, said Saudis need to learn to share the region with the Iranians. Saudis started shaking. They were shaking. Sharing the region with Iran? We're not going to do that. We haven't done that. Sharing the region with Iran means another wave of opposition within Riyadh. What would that look like? So they were extremely fearful, if you will, of that. Saudis also had other problems. Oil prices were coming down. Saudis' debt was accumulating big time. Arab Spring happened in 2009 in Egypt and elsewhere. Saudis were worried because how many times can you, if you remember, uh, Malik Abdullah started ha handing out subsidies of ten, tens of thousands of dollars <coughs> To, to average citizen, and what the average citizen did, they went buy laptops and uh, iPhones so they could actually be more connected rather than less connected. So they were extremely worried about that. So what the Saudis did is the Saudis took an overt campaign in a way to uh, make sure Iran is not going to be the same after JCPOA. They reached out to the Clinton campaign, they reached out to uh, President Trump's campaign, and they said, listen, it's not going to work this way. At the time, President Obama sold almost $100 billion worth of weapons to the Saudis to calm them down. But that wasn't good enough for the Saudis. Right? If you look at this, uh, if you will, uh, uh, I, I, I like this because it gives you a sense of the region in terms of its military force, in terms of its readiness, in terms of its uh, you know, personnel from Army, Air Force, paramilitary, and so on and so forth. What we are seeing in the course of time is we're seeing uh, the broader Middle East is becoming more weaponized. And this is, this, is, this is what we're seeing right now. And this is one of my arguments is more weaponized, if you will, Middle East means they have to have a points of decompression. Those points, we're gonna get, uh, uh, we're gonna get to them um, in, um, in, in a second. I was at the foreign ministry of Iran that um, one of the it was becoming more visible that um, Saudi, the Americans, the Iranians will have one of those friction points in Syria. Regardless of the faith of Assad, Syria is gonna be a huge problem. As we see, it is still a big problem for the, if you will, for the, for the, for the, uh, for the Iranians. We argued in um, a piece that we wrote for um, Tehran Times that uh, regardless of whether it's going to be Trump in the office or Clinton in the office, Iran needs to work with Washington and Riyadh on the issue of Syria. We still think that. 
Um, if they don't, it's going to be extremely problematic, and it could be, if we call it the trigger point or strategic trigger point between US and, I'm sorry, between Iran and Saudi in the coming months, if not years. So Syria is of strategic importance. Um, but for us, Iran has always been this iceberg in the region. Looking at it politically, economically, um, and as the U.S. was titanic, it was doomed to fail with its Iran policy in the region. We still think that's the case. That is the, if you will, the political geography of Iran. Still, we don't know what direction it's going to take or how fast it's going to go. With the inauguration of President Trump, we, we believe things are going to be going on a, if you will, downward path. We just didn't know how fast it was going to go on a downward path. When the president made his first foreign trip to Saudi Arabia, we knew that the United States foreign policy is going to go towards, we call it transactional foreign policy. What do I get versus what I'm going to give you? And Saudis and the Americans will always were in this comfort zone of transactional relationship. The Iranians were not. And the Iranian leadership began to see, oops, things are not going in the right direction for JCPOA. And, uh, Perhaps sooner than us, they realized JCPOA was going to fall apart after Trump made the trip over to um, uh, Saudi Arabia. Till May of 2018, when the president decides to unilaterally withdraw from JCPOA, and we are here today um, with so many what I uh, would, uh, would I, uh, argue trigger points, whether from Strait of Hormuz to Afghanistan to Bubble Mandab and elsewhere in the region, we're having a lot of friction points between the United States and, if you will, um, uh, Iran, and also Saudi Arabia. I have not told you anything that you don't know up to this point, and perhaps as I move forward. We just briefly talked about the political geography of Iran, something we all talk about at our dinner tables, something that we all argue about, we fiercely disagree, sometimes we agree, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, we, we really don't know what to think of. But what I also want to tell you a little bit about Iran's functional geography that we don't often talk about. That's my job. My job is to look at countries' functional geography because I think it's much more important than their political geography. That was my, one of my favorite pictures of Tehran. And this is one of my favorite, if you will, quotes. There are decades where nothing happens, and uh, there are weeks where decades happen. And that is certainly true with Iran in two different recent time periods. One is the JCPOA. The other one is President Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA. So much has happened with the price of real going down, with the protesting we're seeing right now, with, which is it's just a chaotic situation. I was in Tehran for a good bit of time, and I also got a chance to read the newspapers. I, 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 I like looking at the newspapers. If, you're, if you are an Iran follower, and by Iran follower, I don't mean uh, Radio Fado or BBC, I mean also what the Iranian government is trying to, uh, to show in their news. Uh, if the Supreme Leader speaks, it's probably headline news. First is the Supreme Leader, so whatever he says is gonna come first. Other big news was about the, at the time that I was following this news was about SWIFT. Iran was de-SWIFTed, so I'm taking you back to 2016. Iran was re-entered the global market, financial market. The other was about the German delegation coming to Iran to, signing a con to sign a contract, uh, industrial contract with Iran, and another was an OPEC meeting. This is typical, if you will, news, if you will, front page news in Iran. But the real news that didn't get much coverage was this trend. A train, Safe. absolutely, a train that took a 9,500 kilometer journey from eastern China through Urumqi, which is western province in China, Central Asia, and down from Turkmenistan, and all the way through, if you will, the uh, northern provinces of Iran, or Khorasan, and then it came to Tehran. It shortened the 
commercial distance between Shanghai and Bandar Abbas by anybody wants to take a guess how many days? So 15 days for the train to arrive. You bet. What is, a, what is the commercial route between Shanghai and Bandar Abbas? Maybe over a month. You are right. It's 45 days. So it shortened it by 30 days. That wasn't on the cover of the newspaper. Was that new? Or? No. 2016. Distance, a, a distance that the uh, train traveled, yeah. 9,500 kilometers, right. President Xi of China visited Tehran. Prior to his visit to Tehran, he visited Riyadh. He signed a wonderful lucrative deal with the, with the Saudis. He came to Iran, signed a $65 billion deal with the Iranians. I spent quite a bit of time with the, um, if you will, uh, Chinese diplomats. I still do. I travel to China often. This is ambassador, uh, Chinese ambassador to Tehran. Very, very nice guy. And he told me a lesson about the Chinese diplomacy. He says, the problem with the Americans in the region is they pick between Iranians and the Saudis. We don't. We work with, we work with both of you. And that's because we look at functional diplomacy not political diplomacy. He also taught me another lesson. This is a Chinese proverb. Iranians have many of it. This is the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Iranians have something similar to that as well. That was a Chinese attitude towards Iran back then. It is still today with all this noise that we're seeing. The way the, Rush, uh, the, way the uh, Chinese saw Iran was Precisely this way. Iran's, if you will, functional um, geography. And nothing, nothing more, nothing less. They are obviously a big believer of what we call, used to call it OBOR, one belt, one road. Now we call it BRI, or, or Belt and Road Initiatives, which is referring to the Silk Road and the new Silk Road. It is kind of weird because the belt is actually referring to the, uh, to the land uh, uh, corridor. The, the road is referring to the maritime corridor um, between uh, connecting, if you will, Eurasia. And they realized, the, if you will, the, 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 the market potentials of this. By the way, if you look at this, the Silk Road countries have the lowest level of tariffs and, ter and, bar uh, and trade barriers between them. Much lower than NAFTA, what used to be. Much lower than TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the President uh, American president would draw from it as well. So it is a huge, if you will, political and economic opportunity, and also logistic and uh, from a logistic and infrastructure. Another lesson I've learned from the Chinese ambassador to Tehran is says amateur talk strategy. Strategy professionals talk logistics. Ruzbe, we're professionals. I said thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Since 2016, I checked with the ambassador again. He still believes that, and Chinese are still doing it that way. So, let me give you a perspective. Um, this has been done by a colleague of mine named Farak Khanna. He is looking at the functional geography, if you will. Obviously, this is the map of Eurasia. We got Asia, we got Europe, we got part of Northern Africa over here. And what we call this, we call it the political map. But let's do something. Let's add a new layer to it, if you will. If you see, if you can see these, I'm sorry for it, it's a little bit blurry, but you see these black dots. Can you guess what they are? That's population concentration. Okay. See the black dots you see on the, you see coastal China, China. and you see even with Iran, yeah. we got it over here. Nobody's living in the caviars or in the deserts. Right? So these are population concentrations. Let me add another layer. Any guesses what these are? These dots are? Uh, these are uh, ports, yes. These are ports. Another layer, any guesses? These are actually large international airports, like Miami International Airport, that's Imam Khomeini International Airport, Shanghai, Bandar Abbas, or you name it. Let me add another layer to it. 
any guesses? These are minor airports, like smaller cities that they have airports, right? Let me add another layer to it. High speed, high speed trains, high speed trains. By the way, China is building on average uh, 10,000 kilometers of high speed rail per year. Okay. We're still trying to build the one between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And the Iranians have been trying to build one between Tehran, Qom, Esfahan, and since the end of Ahmadinejad's first term, and uh, nothing has been done. This is the proposed uh, uh, high-speed railway connecting Siberia to Asia. These are major waterways. Let me add another layer. These are gas lines, if you will. Let me add another layer. These are water corridors connecting Eurasia. Another layer, these are major gas lines. So let me add another layer to it. Any guesses? Close, fiber optic internet cables. Under the sea, under the ocean fiber optic uh, uh, cables. Let me add another line. Any guesses? <laughs> and I'm talking about all these pins. These are air routes, flights, daily flights that are taking place through all these, uh, if you will, locations, all these cities. So what I did was I just covered for you so many other layers on top of what we call it the political geography of a of a of a of a region. So let me do let me do yourself a, let me. Do me a favor, and let me see, let me go. So I'm adding infrastructure layers, if you will, to, to this. But let me move forward because I want to show you something different. What I did was I took out the layer underneath it, which, which, was, which was the political geography. Yeah, very good. Folks, if I want you to think it, I know there's a lot of ways we think of, think of Iran, but if we want to add another way to think of Iran, I want you to think of Iran this way. Could Iran be eliminated in this connectivity revolution in any shape or form? Absolutely not. It is a vital part of this. It is part of, it is part of the connectivity revolutions of the 21st century. It is impossible, regardless of who's in power, Today's politics, Twitter attack by Trump or Rouhani, the supreme leader in place or not in place, uh, Mr. Pahlavi coming back or not coming back, Iranian Revolutionary Guard increasing his power or not increasing his power. Bottom line is this connectivity revolution needs to stay in place what, and will stay in place. I uh, showed this to my mother and my mom. Uh, she doesn't like politics whatsoever. She compared it to this. Anybody knows what this is? By Jackson Pollock, yeah. So uh, it, is, it is a piece of art. It is, it is indeed a piece of art. So this is essentially the argument that we are making. The way that we are seeing it is we are seeing that the, the, the broader Eurasia region is becoming more interconnected. And the Chinese are doing it. And they are not letting politics, if you will, impact it in any shape or form. Here is an optimistic picture. How many of you have children? How many of you have grandchildren? Maybe, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, how many are, of you are very optimistic about the future? Very optimistic? Future in general. What, what, f future in general, I think future, future, okay, very optimistic, okay. I tend not to be that optimistic about the future. Maybe that's my youth and inexperience. But then charts and statistics sometimes make me optimistic. I want you to take a look at this because you're, uh, children, your grandchildren might be going to school, your children might be going to college by 2025 if they haven't already. So this is a defense spending in the world so far. This is an infrastructure spending in the world. We are building more roads, more airports, more ports, more, if you will, water pathways, than we're building weapons. This is the story of the world today. It's not as pessimistic as we are seeing it thus far. And majority of this is happening in Asia. 
and in Eurasia, if you will. If we look at the countries that are covered by Obor, or One Belt, One Road, Iran was also one of the founding members. And uh, it remains a vital part of it. One of the interesting things that I, uh, so these are, by the way, this, this is the economic route, and this is also the maritime route that you want to, if, if, if uh, uh, for your information, I have it here. But if, a lot of things is also happening with this as well, which I'm not going to go through the, uh, through the corridors. But one of the interesting things that we are seeing as a result of new sanctions, because the sanctions are looming on Iran, it's going to happen as of next week, as a few days from now, on precious metals, it's going to happen with, uh, with uh, oil, and then, uh, I'm sorry, it's going to happen, uh, right, precious metals and Rial and petrochemical, and oil is going to happen in November, right? So, but, uh, but uh, where is Iran going to go for its financing? What Iran is going to do for its financing is going to go to something called AIIB, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Asian Infrastructure, Infrastructure Investment Bank has four offices in Tehran as we we're speaking. They are looking at lending. Chinese are lend, not lending because they like the Iranians. Chi Chinese are lending is because they want to connect Europe to Asia. And that's precisely what they're doing. Um, let me move forward. I'm a, I'm a big fan of maps. Uh, this is one of the maps that I, I, um, I hold because I think maps tell us a better history and better place in, uh, in a better rep re reflection of Iran's politics today than what we hear in the news. So I would urge you to take a look at a lot of maps when you're looking at Iran. What happened to be in the United States? It's not the most optimistic thing that I'm gonna share with you, but if you look at the countries that we have our largest trading partners is America is 56. Countries that have China as its largest trading partner is 124. One of the arguments we've made with JCPOA, uh, obviously we know politics is local, we're sitting in America, uh, so everything for us is from an American perspective. Even a lot of Iranian politicians have been educated here prior to the revolution, the defense, uh, deputy defense minister, foreign minister, and others. And they are also looking at it from the Western perspective. There's a very good book I urge you to read, it's called Destined for War, for war with, uh, uh, written by Graham Allison of Harvard, is talking about this rivalry between China and the United States. So you wanna understand where Iran is gonna be, see where, where this rivalry is gonna wind up, it's gonna end up. And the argument we're making is, JCPOA made Iran also pivot away from Asia and look more towards the West. And what we're seeing with Mr. Trump is this pivot is going to take a U-turn, is, is gonna go back to the East, where we're gonna go to my prediction about Iran, which I try to shy away from prediction, but again, what I think the out, um, outlook might look like for Iran. I spent a good bit of time in Tehran also to advise uh, the office of the president. And uh, this is the office of the president, um, and we talked to, because uh, he has this huge bureaucracy of various advisors, and, uh, and uh, what the Iranians, despite all this noise, all this corruption, all this bad news coming, uh, coming out of Iran, we're talking about, we're all talking about the younger Iranians, the uh, bureaucrats that, that are looking at, is they're trying to build a Singapore model out of Iran. Whether it's doable or not, I genuinely don't know. But these are the things that they are talking about right now. They need more Jewish strategies, they are thinking about, it's okay for us not to be a democracy, but we need to be a, a meritocracy. We cannot have this better, uh, you probably saw the argument of better genes, bad genes, good genes, and this and that with the, with the Iranian Aghazadeh, if you will, uh, uh, class. So uh, that's, what's, that's what's being debated right now, uh, so far. We also looked at Iran from another standpoint to give you a more optimistic picture. Iran's ICT or uh, telecommunication industry is booming immensely, despite all these problems that we're seeing. Iran's digital economy is growing. Iran is the first country, because of the US sanctions, has talked about using cryptocurrency, if you will, to replace other major currencies. Whether or not it's gonna happen, I don't think it will happen, I don't think it's a viable option, but talking about it, it's rather bold. Also, I wanted to share with you a little bit of these graphs again. Uh, we look at 
much uh, so uh, when we look at the region, we look at uh, regions commerce with uh, Europeans and with the Americans. We we argue the flow of commerce is changing. This is a the thickness of the line shows the volume of trade. So we're looking at it, the volume of trade between, if you will, east and west. This is in 2001, and this is in 2011. It's getting more thick between east and east, and south and south. By south and south, I'm referring to Africa to Africa. By east and east, I'm, I'm referring to Asia to Asia. So this is a flow of services. Now this is a flow of finance in 2002. Let's look at it in 2012. Okay, it is actually re it's being reduced. It's shrinking on the U.S. side. Let's look at something else. Flow of goods. This was a picture in 1980. This is a picture in 2011. Okay, so flow of goods and services is changing immensely. Flow of people in 2002. If my parents, I always I use this test. I said, Mom, Dad, if you were to move. Imagine this was the 1970s that you were gonna move. I asked my parents, where do you think you will move? My dad would immediately jump in and say Singapore. He would not say the United States, he would not say, I will say in Iran, he says Singapore. So, and this is a flow of people in 2002, this is a flow of people in 2010. I'm sorry, I don't have an up-to-date for this one because it hasn't been updated yet. Flow of data and communication in 2008, and look at the flow of communication in 2013. So the argument we're making is the Silk Road, Silk Road is back in a very, very big way. And that's the argument that I am making with my colleagues when we are talking about Iran. So if you have grandkids, you probably don't recognize what we have here. Do you know what we have here? This is it's a Nike. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a Nike. Nice shoes. It's nice shoes. <laughs> Any other guesses what these shoes are? Chinese. Well, yeah, but I'm not going after the origins of them. I'm going after some. It's a Kobe, Nike. Yeah, yeah Kobe Bryant, right? Ooh. But what edition? Silk Road wow. edition. Nike's catching up. We better catch up as well. So, what do we have here? It's a Saraband version of Hermes. Oh, they do have it in the d design district. What is that? Samarkand perfume of, yeah. I'm sorry, Hermes. Yes. So Silk Road is back in a very big way, also in our, if you will, in the, in the, in the fashion sense. All the Istans in the world are also looking at Iran as an indispensable, if you will, missing link in this Eurasian connectivity. And I certainly believe uh, uh, believe that much more so than the political noise that we're seeing in today's, if, if you will, today's 24-7 uh, news cycle. Again, these are the routes we're looking at. Iran is going to be, Chabahar is not going to be competition to, to Pakistan, and Pakistan is going to be no competition to Chabahar as well. It, still, Chabahar makes the best route, if you will, connecting, connecting, if you will, the broader Asia region to Central Asia region and Africa to Central Asia region. We cannot change geography in that sense. And let me take you back to Tehran a bit uh, more as, uh, as we're thinking about sanctions and, and else. I spent a good bit of time in Iran. Um, and I, um, I like it for many reasons and I dislike it for many reasons. And I see a lot of people are worried about the sanctions. Being here in my suit, in my tie, um, not making a real base salary, it's easy to talk about. But I also feel extreme uh, empathy with Iranians, young Iranians my age that are becoming unemployed. Um, and they're losing their jobs, they're losing their hope. And uh, um, all this wonderful presentation is not a good substitute for good hope or good job. And, and I, I agree with that. And I, I do believe the sanctions are gonna come back. And I think the sanctions are going to um, hurt Iran's uh, Diminishing middle class, I believe it's going to be hurting Iran's uh, youth and certainly it's going to crush the very tiny hope that exists in the young Iranians so far. However, said that, uh, if you look at it, I have friends that are working for companies like Renault Group, which is about to leave Iran. 
We don't know how, we don't know how soon, but they're, they're talking about leaving. But they're being replaced with the Chinese company called Brilliance Auto Group. When you look at another example, we have Total that is leaving Iran, that is being replaced with CNPC, if you will, company. So when we read a lot of news in Iran, we tend to see a lot of noise. But also, I believe in the next decade or so, Iran is going to become very much uh, a closer strategic partner, at least economically, to China. And uh, the argument I make is um, uh, in the next decade or so, regardless of the faith of the current government in Iran, which is absolutely irrelevant to our prediction of the future, is Iran, one way or another, will be part of this connectivity, and we think the winning bet for us is going to be the Chinese. And we think that's going to happen much faster with the Chinese. I spend a good bit of time in Tehran and in Iran traveling. And um, one of the things that I've done in Tehran is I talked to a lot of people. This is me in one of Iran's caravan saros. Actually, this is, closer, this is close to uh, Yazd, close to a Zoroastrian temple, temple called Peter Chak Chak, uh, and uh, I, I really enjoy that. And I, I really kind of like uh, 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 talking to the Iranians about their experiences, what they feel, how they, how they see the world. And, and Hajim Esmail Agha, who was taking care of one of those carbon uh, uh, uh taught me a really important lesson. He said, Iranian politics never survives, but what always survives is Iranian culture. The fact that you gathered here today is what got you together, that gravity, that 9.8 gravity, is not due to the politics of JCPOA. It's something within the culture, and I've seen it, I sensed it, and I really believe, regardless of what's gonna happen, that culture is gonna, that's, that culture certainly will thrive, uh, regardless of the political functionality of Iran. One of my favorite statements from uh, uh, one of Iran's uh, photographers, Nasrullah Castro Iyan, and he wrote this, he says, he, uh, and I kind of uh, changed it a little bit, he talked about Iran here, so he says, it leaves you uh, no choice but to probe deeper with the passage of time. And, and going deeper with this passage of time is not necessarily political in nature, it's not JCPOA uh, related, but it's certainly, um, um, it's certainly uh, um, uh, in my opinion, much beyond that. And since uh, uh, we started our talk with the graffiti, and I um, uh, show you one of my first, one of my favorite uh, uh, photos in Iran, which shows a difference between a couple of generations, and uh, my worry about the young generation, which is dreaming, and I really hope in this course of, if you will, 10 to 15 years, as Iran is making this transition, their dreams are not going to be crushed. And that is what I can hope for in the process, and since we started our uh, talk, and I had no idea with, uh, with poetry, and I uh, um, leave you with, uh, and since the conversation was about politics, I leave you with Sohrab uh, uh poem that uh, I saw a train that was carrying politics and it was traveling so empty, and I butchered it. But that's, uh, I, am, uh, I apologize for making you travel in the past 45 minutes so empty with, with politics, but I genuinely believe that in uh, uh, the next decade or so, Iran will have a fantastic future. It just uh, 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 needs to be looked at more uh, from a de-emotionalized standpoint, more functional. And I really hope in the process, we see our next, the next generations of Iranians dream not to be crushed in a, in, a in a manner that we have seen it in the past few weeks. So with that, I wanna thank you and I, uh, uh, would love to interact with you, hear your thoughts about it, and if I can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.